Hey, I'm Phil Harper, this is Truth Loader, and since we've just figured out that the NSA are effectively spying on everyone in the United States, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at the history of the surveillance culture of the NSA. To really understand it, you have to go back to September the 11th, 2001. In the weeks that followed, George Bush secretly authorized the NSA to conduct a classified surveillance operation on the US soil. It was codenamed Stellar Wind, or sometimes referred to as the President's Surveillance Program. Now, when you spy on someone, you are supposed to go and get a warrant. But the Bush administration wanted to sidestep this whole system, so they turned to their legal guy, John Yoo. And in 2001, he released a memo that said this. We think the better view is that the Fourth Amendment does not apply to domestic military operations designed to deter and prevent further terrorist attacks. So that was that, a razor thin legal justification to get rid of the Fourth Amendment in the wake of the terrorist attacks. At the time, the NSA were already experimenting with a wiretapping system. It was called Thin Thread and it was very powerful. It was able to automatically wiretap phone calls and it could analyze emails. It had an auditing system built in so we could see how analysts were using the data and all data on there was encrypted and it could only be decrypted if the system suspected suspicious activity was taking place. After September 11th, 2001, Thin Thread was scrapped and what replaced it was called Trailblazer and it was put out to tender to huge security companies. Now, according to people who worked at the NSA, at that time, top executives were having a job at the agency, then having a job at a huge contractor and earning a huge amount of money. And it was within this culture that Trailblazer was born. So in 2002, some NSA employees became concerned and they filed an official complaint with the Department of Defense citing issues with Trailblazer, things like fraud, privacy issues, wiretapping issues, and a concern for the general direction the NSA were headed. In the very same year, 2002, DARPA, that stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, announced the Information Awareness Office. The symbology of the logo speaks for itself, and they stated their ambitions in their main project, Total Information Awareness. The motto on the logo reads Sienta S Potentia, or in English, knowledge is power. On the concerns they could create an Orwellian system, Congress closed down the Total Information Awareness Office in 2003, and perhaps the public side a breath of relief. But in reality, much of that technology was simply transferred to the NSA headquarters, where the technology continued to be developed under a different name. This guy, Mark Klein, is a former employee of AT&T. He described, as early as 2004, secret rooms being built by the NSA and AT&T. One of these rooms was called 641A, and he described how these systems worked. They were copying everything flowing across the major internet links between AT&T's network and other companies' networks. And it struck me, at the time that this is a massively unconstitutional, illegal operation. These installations only make sense if they're doing a huge, massive, domestic dragnet on everybody. And on describing the system, Mark Klein said this. These installations enable the government to look at every individual message on the internet and analyze exactly what people are doing. That was in 2004. Thomas Drake was one of the original complainants in the 2002 complaint to the Department of Defense, and he was speaking publicly about some of his concerns at the NSA. One thing you did not do, it was the prime director of NSA. It was you know, the, the First Amendment at NSA, which is you do not spy on Americans. And what'd you find? Without a warrant. I found, to, much to my, to my horror, that they had tossed out that legal regime. That it was the excuse of 9-11, which I was told was exit conditions now prevailed. We can essentially can do anything. We op opened up Pandora's box. We're going to turn the United States of America into the equivalent of a foreign nation for the purpose of a of dragnet blanket electronic surveillance. 
Thomas Drake, years later, would be charged under the Espionage Act. Then there was William Binney, another former NSA employee, also one of the original complainants in 2002, who was also speaking publicly about problems with wiretapping at the NSA. Do you believe all emails the government has copies of in the United States? I, would th I, I believe they have most of them, yes. And you're speaking from a position where you would know, considering your position in the National Security Agency. Right. All they would have to do is put uh, various uh, uh, nearest devices at uh, various points along the network, at choke points or convergent points where the network converges, and they could basically take down and uh, have copies of most everything on the network. His home was later raided by FBI agents and he was forced to close down his business. But it doesn't end there. In 2005, Russell Tice, another former employee of the NSA, also went public with his story. When it turned out that he had been a source for a New York Times article, two FBI agents appeared at his house and told him he was being summoned to court for breaking federal law. After that, he issued this statement. This latest action by the government is designed only for one purpose to ensure that people who witness criminal action being committed by the government are intimidated into remaining silent. But in May 2006, the USA Today reported on the NSA's call database. It contained 1.9 trillion call detail records of US citizens. And it allowed the NSA to build up a social graph of the connections between people. In the very same month, Seymour Hersh reported that a contact inside the NSA said that they had begun to eavesdrop on Americans' conversations. He said that tens of thousands of Americans had had their calls monitored in one way or another. Despite warnings that surveillance technology had infiltrated all internet traffic and that phone calls were being monitored, society just marched on. And in 2006, just as social networking was going mainstream, this video detailing some shady investments in Facebook began to go viral. The first venture capital money totaled at $500,000 came to the Facebook from venture capitalist Peter Thiel, founder and former CEO of PayPal. He also serves on the board of radical conservative group Vanguard PAC. Further funding came in the form of $12.7 million from venture capital firm Excel Partners. Excel's manager, James Breyer, was former chair of the National Venture Capital Association. Breyer served in the National Venture Capital Association's board with Gilman Louie, CEO of InQtel, a venture capital firm established by the Central Intelligence Agency in 1999. This firm works in various aspects of information technology and intelligence, including, most notably, nurturing data mining technologies. Breyer has also served on the board of BBN Technologies, a research and development firm known for spearheading the ARPANET of what we know today as the internet. In October of 2004, Dr. Anita Jones climbed on board BBN along with Gilman Louie. But what is most interesting is Dr. Jones' experience prior to joining BBN. Jones herself served on the board of directors for InQtel and was previously the director of defense research and engineering for the U.S. Department of Defense. Her responsibilities included serving as an advisor to the Secretary of Defense and overseeing the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. This goes farther than just the initial appearances. DARPA shot to national fame in 2002 when knowledge of the existence of the Information Awareness Office came to light. But we just shrugged it off. Perhaps in 2006, the idea that Facebook was some kind of crowdsourced surveillance mechanism would have been too difficult to believe. But would we think the same now? So by 2006, the American public knew that warrantless wiretapping of American citizens was taking place, but we couldn't see it. It was just some abstract idea. And the American political establishment were doing a very good job at keeping a lid on it. Speaking in 2004, George Bush said this. Now, by the way, anytime you hear the United States government talking about wiretap, it requires, a wiretap requires a court order. Nothing has changed. And yet we now know that George Bush had authorized warrantless wiretapping on American citizens way back in 2001. So all of the whistleblowers over the last 10 years who've tried to draw our attention to this are now engaged in a huge I told you so. Speaking in 2012, William Binney, formerly of the NSA, said this. It's going towards a totalitarian state will have an imperial president and a dictator. Everyone in Congress is violating the Constitution by supporting this activity. 
So the recent leak by Edward Snowden shows us that the NSA surveillance program didn't slow down. In fact, it's probably got more sophisticated. We now know the NSA can wiretap almost anyone and has access to their private data. Are we surprised? Or do these leaks simply confirm the work of many other whistleblowers over the past decade? Perhaps what we can take from this is we need to reconsider how we respond to whistleblowers when they tell us things we don't want to hear. We want to hear your thoughts about this whole story, so let us know in a comment. If you haven't already, click subscribe and check out the other video we made about the NSA surveillance program. We'll see you guys again next time.